I'm Scott Allen Miller and welcome to my camera cafe. I apologize for those of you who have been subscribed and waiting for a new episode. We've taken a little bit of a hiatus, but pro I promise you we've got some cool stuff coming and I think today's episode is going to be a nice preface to some of the stuff we're going to do and I have some new camera gear arriving in just a few days uh, that I'll be talking about obviously and reviewing and several new lenses, uh, some new equipment, some new cameras, all kinds of stuff. But today we're going to be talking about one of the cameras that I, I love a lot and you've seen it on the show. I've talked about it a little bit, the Nikon D3500, but today we're going to focus a little bit on the D3000 family as a family of DSLRs uh, because I think this is it's interesting as a bit of history and I think this line of cameras uh, is a bit important and it's one that I use and I like a lot. Um, today we're going to talk about the get this overview of the family. Right, but in the future, I'm going to do some shows with the D3500 and show some of the uh, outcome, the the products of that camera, because I use it uh, a bit for uh, scenery, a bit for landscape, um, but quite a bit for nighttime event shooting. And uh, I've got some some cool footage from that, and I think uh, you may like some of the some of the stuff we see come out of that. It's a very affordable, very approachable line of cameras if you're looking for something in that SLR family, which a lot of people aren't anymore, but there's a whole world of inspiration for shooting that comes from the SLR modality, right? It's a lot of fun to use an SLR. Now, if you're looking for something really versatile where you're going to be able to uh, use it for video and you're going to be able to throw it and you just have, you know, a lot of future proofing, a lot of the SLRs are generally not going to work out very well for you. But if you're looking for something as a photographer, that's going to be inspirational, it's going to be fun, that's going to be really good for producing some, some pictures for just the right use cases, an SLR may be perfect for you, and this family may offer a bit. I actually have a, a number of topics I want to do from this family, which I think you'll find interesting. We're going to get to those, but having this overview is important. I also really like the Nikon D3000 series because here, where I'm based, which a lot of you don't know because it's a camera show, but I'm based in Central America, and here, of all the cameras that I see, the D3000 series from Nikon is the one I'm most likely to see easily when I'm out and involved with people who are doing photography, not video work, but if they're just doing photography work, this series of cameras I see nearly half the time. All other cameras combined is about the same volume as this family of cameras. So here, these are super popular, but only certain models. We're gonna to get to that in just a minute. I have some cheat sheets with me, but this is the D3500. This is the one that I use almost all the time. For the majority, the vast majority of photography work that I do is with this camera. I have a number of lenses for it, so I, I vary on lenses quite a bit, but not on camera body. I love shooting with an SLR. And so having a digital SLR, which I've had now, uh, coming up on probably 16 to 18 years that I've been using, uh, maybe even longer, uh, a digital SLR, always a Nikon for me, um, it's been it's been something that I really, I just enjoy working with them. I enjoy what it feels like to work with an SLR. When I work with mirrorless, sometimes it's a lot of fun. Um, and I really love some of my mirrorless cameras. We're on a mirrorless right now. But when it comes to just straight photography, majority of the time, I'm going to prefer picking up and using my DSLR uh, for, for basic shooting. Now, just because everyone always wonders, we're shooting today, and sorry for the dogs in the background, uh, we're on the Olympus EM1 Mark II, which does just an amazing job. I love this camera. And we're on the M's uh 17 millimeter premium, the 1.8 uh, lens, and we've got it set to uh, F2. So that's the look that you're getting today is from that. This is the first show that I've done on the 17 millimeter. I don't tend to use it. I tend to shoot on a 25. Felt like doing the 17 today. Uh, and microphone, we're, we got a lot of wind. And so I decided it was a good day to bring out the Rode Micro with the giant dead cat. I'm hoping that that's cutting the wind pretty well for you guys. So I apologize if you're hearing a bit of wind. We'll do what we can to clean that up. I have new microphones coming as well with the new equipment, but this is one of those traditional Rode micros. It does an amazing job. I've not used it actually with the Olympus before. So we're kind of testing out that combination, but I'm sure it's gonna sound just fine. All right, I have a cheat sheet because it's hard to keep track of all the specs. So the Nikon D3000 line consists of six cameras. They all share basically the same form factor. They look almost identical. You'll struggle from a distance to tell them apart. Uh, and they, they came out over a number of years. They discontinued the series in 2018. So the most recent one, which is still available, which is the 3500 that I have here, 
is already six years old. Uh, so they really aren't, they, they, they really moved away from this line quite some time ago. So the first model that came out is 2009, so it's a full 15 years ago. Well, it was July, so we're nearly 15 years ago at this time. That was the D3000 itself. This was a 10.1 megapixel uh, DSLR, and what it was, I'll give you a little bit of background. Prior to the D3000 series, uh, Nikon had been making a number of DSLRs, and they've been experimenting with a number of things. And the D50, for example, was, I believe, the first at six uh, megapixels, and it was CCD-based, and I have that camera, not here with me, but I do have it, and it did an amazing job, right? And the colors were, were spot on, just absolutely be beautiful images. From there, they, they did very incremental changes, and the, the D40, the D40X, the D70, and then the D80, was the last of the exact original line of cameras in the uh, in the two-digit line, which was kind of their semi-pro. Right? The D80 had this 10.1 megapixel CCD sensor, was an amazing camera, uh, very very well received, uh, and then they needed to move forward. And that was when the big leap was made between CCDs and CMOS. And Nikon made the decision to jump pretty quickly to the D90 with its 12 megapixel CMOS sensor instead of the 10.1 megapixel CCD sensor in the D80. They basically had the same body. Now I have had the D90 since its original release. I had the D50, still have the D50, uh, but at six megapixels and it was very slow, very, not entry level, but very entry to the DSLR world. It was, uh, they were still getting their feet under them for making cameras. So there's a lot of things like the processing speed is very, very slow. The D90 became my workhorse SLR for more than a decade. It's an absolutely brilliant camera. It works great today. If you could go pick one up for a good price, you will have, I guarantee, really excellent results. And in reality, the D80 will give you excellent results as well. I don't know how much older than that I would go. Personally, the D40X perhaps uh, in the right right circumstances, but uh, in general, the D80 is kind of as old as I would want to go if I was picking up a Nikon DSLR today, but uh, your mileage may vary as to what it is you're interested in. So when the D90 came out, it was at a pretty, pretty high price point, and it was a really high megapixel count, a very dense sensor for the time, and Nikon decided they wanted to bring in something more entry level than they'd never had as entry level as they wanted to have, or at least not in the digital world. So they brought out the D3000 with four digits, making it the lowest level camera that they had in their DSLR line. Now, all of this, of course, at the time, the DX sensors, that is now an APS-C sensor, uh, or crop sensor, as people like to call it. I hate that term because it is not correct. It is not cropped in any way. We use a crop factor as a number, and so we call it that, but it is not cut down from a larger sensor. The original releases from Nikon, they started with this DX or digital sensor. The idea of a full frame sized sensor or their FX series didn't come about until some years later. So all of these early cameras were all DX sensors, all APS-C. You didn't have to worry about looking for uh, different size sensors back at that time. So when Nikon wanted to bring out a lower cost camera, what they did was they looked back to the D80 and said, this was a great camera. People really liked the results, but we didn't sell that many of them and we probably still have parts from it. So they brought out the D3000, which basically had the guts of the D80, but upgraded to be in a much smaller chassis. It, they took some of the uh, benefits of the D80 out. They had a different battery, a few different components. They, they cheapened it up a little bit, but had that same sensor and technology in it. So you were able to get the same images out of the D3000 that you were out of the D80, but you may have given up some of the accoutrements. It was definitely not a step up in any way, but you did get newer firmware. You did get a newer processor, but a lower end processor. So it's not necessarily a win. So in 2009, they brought out the D3000 with that 10.1 megapixel CCD sensor XPeed processor. Now, we have to mention this, and we're going to do a whole talk on XPeed processors sometime in the future, but the XPeed processor uh, under the XPeed name that is in the D3000 came out at a time where they had not yet solidified the model numbers of the processors. So when we say XPeed, you may think that's the XPeed 1 or a very specific processor, but at the time it was three or four different processors that had some varying capabilities, but it was part of the XPeed family. So it was an official XPeed firmware camera, but it was before they really had a clearly defined chip lineup. That would not come until the XPeed 2. It was kind of a ambiguous family of, of processors with sometimes 
rather different results. They had different chip architectures, different firmwares. It was very different. That was 2009. In just over one year, the Nikon D3100 was released, and this was the jump to a CMOS sensor, which was, at this point, Nikon had committed to CMOS as their future. Uh, the idea of CCDs had really, the industry had moved past that. Uh, and so this was, I think, brought out very quickly. I think they, they basically used the D3000. I'm hypothesizing here a little bit. I believe they used the D3000 to really unload a lot of hardware that they had for the D80 family. Uh, and, and pretty much it, the having an entry-level camera proved to be very successful, so they were able to unload very quickly and needed to have an upgrade uh, rapidly. And so this is a very small amount of time for this new camera to come out. The D3000 basically functioned as a holdover, as a stopgap before the 3100. So the 3000 is really kind of a rare camera. It's kind of a, an interesting moment in Nikon's history. The 3100 in 2010 which is a little bit easy to remember, right? Because the numbers kind of make sense. was a 14 megapixel CMOS sensor. Now, the D90, which had already come out before the D3000, was a 12 megapixel CMOS sensor. So this is an upgraded sensor compared to the D90. So if you had been on the D90, but this is a lower line, right? This is still an entry level line. The D90 was a semi-pro, but this is gonna give you an actually upgraded image result compared to the D90 if you had used that. Uh, not just because of the, the 14 megapixels. We don't really care about megapixels once we're kind of beyond 12. You generally have enough. We'll talk about that in future episodes. But uh, this was a newer sensor technology. At this point, sensors were still advancing uh, to some degree. Um, it is worth noting that in the move from the 10.1 megapixel CCD to the 12, uh, I'm sorry, the 14 megapixel uh, CMOS, we also had a really big upgrade just because of the sensor primarily in ISO sensitivity. The CCD was only able to go to a native of 1600 and with whatever they called boost technology, you were able to get to 3200. That's on the 3000. On the 3100, we had a native of 3200 with a boost to 12,800, which is two more stops. So we had one stop boost uh, gain in, in base ISO capability, not base ISO in the Sony sense, but in the native ISO range capability with that boost with two more stops instead of a boost with only one more stop and one fewer stops in the in the base. We also moved up to the XP2 processors. So this is the first one that we think of or really is part of the family of XPs as we think of them today. Those with the original XP name, like I said, it was ambiguous. Um, they did have the XP technology. They behaved like XPs for the most part, but you couldn't identify the family really easily. But with the XP2, this is the XP2 we saw everywhere. Every camera with the XP2, this is the same one. So this was a this was a big leap. This is where Nikon really figured out what their processor plan was going to be, what their family was going to be. Uh, and so getting into the 3100 got you into a much more modern, much more cohesive Nikon DSLR experience moving forward. It was on their new family of CMOS sensors, their new family of of logically numbered and sequential and straightforward uh, X-Speed processors. Uh, and so this was a, a really big breakthrough. This was an entry-level camera that got you into the future of, of where Nikon was going with their, their DX cameras and their DSLR family and uh, uh, proved to be very popular. And, and this will hold its own today. It's better than my D90, uh, which is absolutely adequate. It will certainly be lacking in some areas, but if this was your camera today, you could absolutely do professional work with this. No problem, it is a very satisfying camera. It could be a lot of fun to use. In 2012, so for the rest of these, you'll notice these cameras came out like clockwork every two years. In 2012, the D3200 came out, and this one was important because it made the leap from the 14 megapixel CMOS to the 24 megapixel CMOS, and that was the last sensor upgrade that this family would get until it was discontinued. So all of the rest, the next four models are all 24 megapixels on the same sensor, including this final D3500, same 24 megapixel sensor. The processor, however, was upgraded to the XP3. Now, of course, there's other upgrades that happen along with this at different times. Uh, I believe some of these had changes in like their flash technology, but all those things are pretty minor, especially now looking back. Those aren't the things that we care about generally when we're looking at an antique camera, which is basically how we could consider these, especially these early models. But it had the XP3 processor, so we have a lot better performance and a little bit better JPEG processing, a little bit better computational photography, and 
This is worth noting that the D3000 is the first camera that Nikon released with their computational photography features built in. We'll talk about that in depth in, in an, an, another episode, but this family of cameras used this computational photography to do things that previous camera lines had not done. Of course, upper end models also gain these features, but this is where a lot of people use them first and discovered how they worked. So getting a, a higher end processor, even if you're on the same sensor, could be noticeable for those things. The improved JPEG processing and the improved computational photography have value from speed and they're able to simply do better things with it. But it's also worth noting that these cameras got noticeably faster generation to generation because of that as well. So the 3200 had another ISO performance boost over the older sensor, most likely again because newer sensor technology here. So we have the second large leap in sensors, and this takes us to a native range of ISOs up to 6400. Remember, our first one was 16, the second one was 32, now we're at 6400, and with a boost still to 12,800. So we haven't changed that boost number, but are not needing to boost amount has gone up. So we got a little bit of sensor improvement there. Two years later, the 3300, we have the same 24 megapixel sensor, of course. And once again, we have a processor upgrade. This one goes to the XP4. Now this would be the final upgrade in processors. So now our sensor and processor are the same for the next two after this one. So we have this relatively stagnant uh, ecosystem of these cameras. Of course, firmware is going to improve, the cameras get a little bit lighter, some really small features do change, but by and large, we have a stable camera ecosystem after this point. Now, it's worth noting that with the same sensor, but an improvement in the processor, the ISO performance of the camera is listed as improving. Now, we don't know how much noise we're going to get. We're not doing really detailed pixel peeping, peaking tests to see exactly how much this is affecting anything, but officially they listed the native ranges now going up to 12,800, which was the maximum of boost for the last two and way outside the range of the original. And now the boost goes to 25,600. That's our big spec change on this model with the upgrade to the x 4. So at this point, the next three cameras, the 3300, 3400, 3500, all remain very popular today because you're getting the final processor and the final sensor in all those cameras. The upgrades between them are so minor, very few people consider them at all. So the 3400, what do we find? Again, obviously, same everything, all the specs are the same, except with the change in firmware or marketing, we don't really know, they have removed the boost functionality completely and they now list the camera as going all the way to 25,600 as its native range. This may be a marketing thing. I don't know the history behind this. I haven't dug into this and I'm getting my specs from uh, a third party site who may, have, who may have altered it over time. These are very detailed specs, this is good stuff, but sometimes the way that the specs are repeated and the way that they're collected over time changes a little bit. So we don't know 100% exactly what these represent. Um, and then in 2018, so every year, again, is every two years, we get the D3500, this final model with the 24 megapixel, the x 4 and the native up to 25,600. And that takes us through this family of cameras. Now here in Nicaragua, which is where I am based, we never see 3500s. I've, this is the only one I've ever seen in country. I'm sure they exist, I'm sure they're popular, but they're not popular enough that I've ever run into one. What I do see is the occasional 3200 and 3300 and 3400s everywhere. And the reason is logical. Here, the cost of cameras can be relatively high, accessibility is low, and so uh, getting cameras that have a really good value for what you uh, pay for them is very important. And the 3300 and 3400 deliver all the hardcore specs of this latest 3500, maybe with a little bit more body weight, maybe with a little bit less polish, but the basics, the hardware, is essentially identical between those models, but their cost when you go on to a KEH or an MPB is lower because they are older models. They probably have more wear and tear. They probably have more shutter clicks, uh, more shutter actualizations, and they may not have the firmware updates that the 3500 has, although they may. Right? We don't know that there's actually anything put into the 3500 that those didn't have as well. Uh, and so they're really popular because they're incredibly cost effective to pick up. And of course, if you get into any of the Nikon family in the DX series, all of their lenses are cross compatible across that entire range. Basically everything that's come out after the D50 uh, is able to share nearly all lenses. You have a lot of flexibility, whether manual or 
uh, automatic focus. Uh, and so, so using those slightly older models or even the 3500 often present really amazing value in a high quality DSLR that's going to give you amazing results. Every member of this family is going to give you amazing photographic results. Some of them may be really slow. Some of them may not have the resolution you're looking for. Some of them may not have little tiny features that make your life easier. And, and in many cases, the inability to take uh, images really quickly or maybe lacking some low light performance may cause some of the models to not live up to your expectations in ways that others will. And the 3500 certainly outperforms some of the earlier models in really noticeable ways. I use mine in low light conditions a lot of the time. And if I try to use older models, which I have tested, you may not get the shots at all. And if you do the effort in getting them or the number of good shots you will get in an evening is horrendous, right? It's very, very few. You're waiting so long, many seconds between taking images. Whereas with the 3500, it's click, 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 click. And, and so that's very different. If you're doing sports or you're doing low light, something more uh, new is gonna make a big difference in this lineup. Uh, but if you're doing uh, landscape photography, you're doing architectural photography, maybe even street photography, it may not matter. You may get really good results uh, with one of the older models. So it depends on how you want to use them, depends on your budget. But if you want to get into this line, you have several cameras. You can get in very cheaply, test it out. And if you want to move up to the 3500 or even leave the line and go to other Nikon DX family cameras, you can. Now it's worth noting this last one, the 3500 came out in 2018. There should have been another model in 2020. And by should have, I mean that that is when it would have been due. And the technology to make that next camera was there. After the D3500, Nikon decided that the 24 megapixel sensor was actually too high of megapixels. And it's the same decision that Olympus, which we're on, made that they didn't go beyond, even today, 20 megapixels. They decided to double down on 20 or nearly 20 megapixels, just slightly higher, but not 21. And that is where they felt it was good for the Micro Four Thirds family of cameras. And Nikon made the same decision in APS-C. The new sensor that came out just after this 24 megapixel was a 20 megapixel which I think hurt them a bit because they had to step back in megapixels. We're going to talk about that sensor in a future episode. But following 2018, what would have come out in 2020 would have been the, the D3600 in theory. It would have had the 20 megapixel sensor, probably the XPEED 5 processor to go with it, uh, and could have been really amazing. They did make an upper model that did implement that, but it was not in the D3000 series. It is more expensive. It is still available today. I don't have the number in front of me. I'll pop it on the screen, hopefully. And uh, that, if you want to stick in this family and move to something even newer that really outperforms these, that probably will. But be aware, it outperforms with lower noise, better low light performance, but it does so by trading in the megapixels and losing four megapixels from 24 to 20 is a noticeable drop. That is a serious percentage drop in resolution. Most photographers will never need that resolution. Most care about the low noise far, far more. And so we expect you to get better results from the 20 megapixel sensor, but be aware it is a change. It is not the straightforward uh, evolution that you normally expect or did expect at the time in these sensors. It's also worth noting that that sensor, the 20 megapixel, is the first one that was carried into Nikon's DX mirrorless lines, starting with the Z50 and going on to the ZFC and now the Z30. All of them share that same 20 megapixel sensor that we would have expected to see in the D3600 had it ever been made, which I'm very sad about. I would love to have that camera to complement this one in my lineup of cameras, but it never came out, sadly. So that is your quick guide to, or quick-ish, guide to the Nikon DSLR family of DX cameras in the entry-level D3000 series. I think they're a great camera if you're new to photography, you're looking for something interesting, or you're looking for something that is very low cost that lets you get into a DSLR family. Uh, if you already have mirrorless or you're doing other things and you want something that's just a lot of fun or uh, inspires some creativity, gives you a different feel or modality of photography, then this could be a really great family to choose. And if you're here in Central America, it could be one that's really important for you because it's very easy to get replacement lenses, camera bodies, and so forth, because you'll find these absolutely everywhere. So thank you for joining me today. I'm really glad that you guys have stuck with the channel as it is growing. I'm definitely going to be covering more interesting topics. I wanted to get this kind of overview 
in right away of this family because I, I really like this camera family. Obviously, this is my workhorse photography work. I do a lot of food photography with this as well. A lot of time I'm out at the beach or I'm in restaurants, I'll take this um, and it works really well for that. I love its performance for those things and I like how it works as a DSLR. And of course, I've been using Nikon SLRs uh, since the early 90s. I was a professional uh, newspaper photographer on the uh, Nikon family, and so I'm very used to the controls and the feel of Nikon. So sometimes when I just want that familiarity, that's one of the reasons why I want to pick this up. So that may not matter for you, but for me, this is uh, a very comfortable feeling camera to use. Uh, and so grabbing it as an everyday camera is very easy for me. But uh, we're going to be talking more about those. I've got lots of new stuff coming. I'm going to get this channel back uh, on its feet and coming out regularly, kind of since I did my last couple episodes. I, I wasn't paying really close attention. For those who don't know, I vlog every day. I'm very, very busy as a vlogger. You can watch my shows. Uh, I'll, they'll all be linked down below. So check those out if you're interested. Uh, very different things. I talk about Nicaragua. I talk about technology. I talk about business. I talk about uh, video games. I do a ton of things. Um, and I love talking about cameras. I love being able to have this channel but I haven't had a lot of time with it. And since the last time I looked at it, we've gotten quite a few subscribers and, and getting quite a bit of views on these episodes. So I need to put more effort into this. Thank you for kind of alerting me to that and letting me know that this is content that you guys are interested in. Uh, both vintage cameras and new lenses and camera bodies and microphones. We're gonna get into a lot of things. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. This is a lot of fun for me. And uh, get down there in those comments. Let me know what you'd like me to talk about, questions that you have. Just say what you like, don't like. What are your experiences with the 3500 or other members of the D3000 series? Thanks for joining me, and I will see all of you next time.